Those of you who were here last week, remember? Revelation chapter 4, John introduces us to a worship scene in heaven. This week in chapter 5, we're going to continue that. But what we saw last week is he was elevated up to heaven and able to see this vision, this heavenly vision. He saw one sitting upon the throne who was a sort of a fiery creature, a carnelian, or reflecting the light of a carnelian or a jasper, and uh, had this sort of glow. And he's sitting on the throne. Uh, obviously, this is the Lord God who's sitting upon the throne of heaven. And he's surrounded by 24 elders, probably, are the representatives from Israel, 12 representatives of the apostles, the apostles of the church. And these 24 elders, these 24 presbyters, are gathered around the throne worshiping. There's also four living creatures, which takes us back to Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10. I'm going to say that one more time. You need to read Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10 so you understand what Ezekiel saw looking from the earth up to heaven. John now sees in heaven looking straight on. This is the vision of God. And these creatures, these four living creatures, Cherubim, chapter 10 of Ezekiel tells us. They praise God for five things. They praise God for his holiness. They praise him because he is almighty. They praise him because he is coming and coming to reign. And then the elders joined in to declare his worthiness for worship as the creator to whom all things belong and whose sovereign will brought all into existence. And these five things tell us about what was going on. It sets us up now for chapter 5. We're in the same worship scene. This is continuation. We had to break it up into two Sundays, but you could have done this in one Sunday to see the whole effect. And if you'll go back this afternoon or this evening and read chapter 4 and 5 together, you'll see how it all fits together. In Revelation chapter 5, John says this, Then I saw on the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne a scroll, written on the front and back, and sealed with seven seals. Now, I'm, I'm sure that scroll was always there, but as John is taking all this in, he's, he's relating this, he's telling us the things he saw, and then he goes back and looks, wait a minute, that guy on the throne, God on the throne has a scroll on that throne, a book, literally, <clears throat> and it's written front and back. You can tell there's things written on the back side. Now, we say that's not unusual. We have written things written on the back side all the time. But in that day and time, it was very difficult, particularly if you have a scroll, to write on the back side of a scroll. He would do it. But the reason is because a lot of times the scroll was put together in a way that, that made it difficult to write on the back side. They would put paper together. You'd have strips of paper, and then you'd lay, I'm going to do it backwards for me, but I'll try to. And they'd put strips on this side. Now, so this is the back side, and this is the front side. Which side would be easier to write on? Well, the front side, because you can write across this way. When you get to writing on the back side, you're going to hit all the cracks. It's going to be very difficult to do that. It's not as easy to do. So they didn't normally write on the back side of scrolls. They just wrote on one side of a scroll. Something that has something written on the front and the back, there's a lot that God is bringing about. And so he has, he sees this and sealed also with seven seals. Verse 2. And I saw a powerful angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break the seals? This scroll is the document, the plan of God by which he will accomplish what he revealed in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. A period of 70 sets of seven. You're reading an older version talking about 70 weeks. It's because in Hebrew, the word for weeks is the word for seven. So if you have a week, how many days of the week? Seven. So there are 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the most holy place. Sometimes people wonder, why doesn't God do something about the wickedness on the earth? Why didn't he do something about the people that are misusing nature, misusing the creation of God? 
spoiling things and ruining things upon there. Why didn't God do something about it? Peter, in chapter two, 3 of 2 Peter, verses 3 and 4, says this. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come. The last days, that's the times we're in. Have been in since the first century. <clears throat> scoffers will come, mocking the truth, and following their own desires, and they will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. From that time, the time of John on, people have been saying, well, it just seems like everything happens over and over and over again. We don't seem to be any closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't seem like God is doing anything in our world today. It seems like things are going to go on and on. Sometimes they'll get worse. Sometimes they'll get a little better, and then they'll turn and get worse. And then eventually you die. It's troubling. And the longer you live and the more you watch the world, the more you can be troubled about what is going on. Why isn't God doing something? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth is able to open the scroll or to look in it. So I began weeping bitterly because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. You know how sometimes in a dream, when you have a dream, you know what's going on without there being any foundation laid. John knows this book is important. He knows this book, without this book being open, the plan of God, the purpose of God, and God bringing in righteousness, everything he was trying to that he was going to fulfill in Daniel chapter 9 24 won't happen unless this book gets open. And he weeps. And he doesn't just cry tear to it. He is weeping. Remember, there's a search going on. There's angel cries out. There's a search going on all throughout heaven. Is there anybody here? On the earth, they're searching the earth and under the earth. They're trying to find is there somebody? Who's righteous enough? Who's worthy enough to open the scroll? Is there anybody that can bring an end to the troubles in our world? The difficulties that people face. The terrors that are coming upon our planet. Is there anybody who can do that? And John is weeping and weeping and weeping. And then finally, the response comes to John. One of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. Thus he can open the scroll and its seven seals. I tried to read that comforting as I heard. He's not chiding him. He's not making fun of him. It's not harsh, even though it's a command. Stop weeping. He is encouraging, just like somebody would say, don't fear, don't be afraid. He's saying there is comfort for you. Look, God has always had the man. Always had the plan and always had the man that was going to fulfill the plan. And John, at that point, his eyes were open and he saw God's solution to the problem. I want you to notice where the line of Judah is, how he appears, and two distinct features about it. You listen as I read the next verse. Verse 6. Then I saw standing in the middle of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the middle of the elders, a lamb that appeared to have been killed. Now who is that? Well, he said it's going to be the Lion of Judah. He's expecting to see a lion, the Lion of Judah. Of course, that's figurative. The Lion of Judah is the king. What he sees is a lamb that looks like his throat's been cut, like he's been slain. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now, a horn in Scripture generally is a sign of power, a sign of strength. I used to herd cattle, and you were always more careful about the ones that had horns. It's a sign of power. So this is one who has seven horns. It's a symbol of perfection. Seven is a symbol of perfection. It's the number of perfection. He has perfect power. He's able to do, he's able to accomplish everything that needs to be 
accomplished. He has the power. He also has the seven eyes. Now, remember I told you last week, one of the great things about John in the book of the Revelation, he'll tell you what stuff is. No question. The seven eyes represent the seven spirits of God that are roaming throughout the whole earth. It's a picture of this is one who has the Holy Spirit of God, who sends the Holy Spirit of God, from whom the Holy Spirit of God proceeds out to do the will of God in the world. The agent of God is always the Holy Spirit. In the creation, the Spirit of God moved upon the waters. He is carrying out these actions, and this one is the one who works in harmony with the one who sits on the throne, and he has the seven eyes. He has the ability through the Holy Spirit to do everything in the world. He is accomplishing those things. Luke chapter 1 verse 69 says this about him. And has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. This one who has the horns is the one whom God has raised up from the line of David, out of the seed of Abraham, out of the seed of the woman. This is the one God has raised up to be the Savior. And he is going to open the scroll. John also identifies for us another connection between the Lamb and God, the Holy Spirit. These seven eyes represents the Holy Spirit doing his work, now listen, throughout the whole world with every tribe, language, people, and nation. And then the Lamb does this, verse 7. Then he came and he took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. Remember who's seated on the throne? It's God Almighty. You think you'd have an earth go up to God Almighty and take a scroll out of his hand? You're not going to take it out of his hand if you're not worthy to take it out of his hand. You know, you're in God's hand. You're going to pull you out. Who can overcome God and do something to you? You're protected by God. So this book is in God's hand, and Jesus Christ takes the book. He takes the scroll from the hand of God. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and 24 elders threw themselves to the ground before the Lamb. That's an act of worship. And each of them had a heart and golden bowls full of incense. John identifies, which are the prayers of the saints. Your prayers are being presented in heaven. When you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, when you pray for the salvation of souls, when you pray for God's kingdom to come and Jesus Christ's return. When you're praying for those, those things are not laws. They're preserved and they're being presented in heaven before God. God has not forgotten a single prayer of yours. He is accomplishing them in your time. Verse 9, they were singing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were killed and at the cost of your own blood, you have purchased for God curses from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You have appointed them as a kingdom and priest to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. You know what he's saying? He's talking about you. You have been appointed a kingdom of priests. God's plan for you is to prepare you and to put you in positions where you will rule and reign on this earth and you'll have the job of a priest. You're going to have the job of presenting God to people and people to God. And that's going to take place during the millennium. You're in training right now. What you're doing right now to spread the gospel, to minister to people, to encourage folks, that's, that's what God has given you to do now. That's what he's going to give you to do during the thousand-year reign of Christ. You're going to be a kingdom of priests, and he is going to use you in the kingdom in that manner. John continues, verses 11 to 14, and this, if you, if you picture this, you're going from the throne, the elders, the living creatures, and on out. It's an ever-expanding scene of worship. It's just like the lights are being turned on, and he's seeing more and more of what's going on. Here's what's happening, even now. Verse 11. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels in a circle around the throne, as well as the living creatures and the elders. <clears throat> See, all of a sudden he's seeing, well, there's a bunch of uh, angels here. Their number was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands times thousands. In other words, literally it says there were myriads.
myriads of these creatures, these angels, praising God, all of whom were singing in a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who is killed to receive glory, power, and wealth, and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth, under the earth, in the sea, and all that's in them singing, to the one seated on the throne, and to the Lamb be praise, honor, glory, and ruling power forever and ever. And the four living creatures were saying, Amen. And the elders threw themselves to the ground and worshipped. Everything on earth, when worship is going up in heaven, is worshiping God. The fish in the sea, the birds. You heard the song? All God's creatures got a place in the choir. Well, we're not going to sing that now. But you need to look at it. It's a great song. It's a fun song. And it tells, it's from this truth. Everything in the universe is designed to praise God, and when it praises God, by whatever means God has given for that praise to take forth, it and we are fulfilling our place in God's plan. That's the reading of Scripture. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, as we think about it in these next few minutes, Lord, help us to make worship a permanent part of our life. Particularly, Lord, this week, we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I want to talk about four things here from this passage that I noticed here. One thing we need to understand is that God is not slack concerning his promises. 2 Peter 3 9 talks about that, but Revelation 5 5. Sometimes we get down and we get weeping because things aren't going right. We have suffering, and we see other people suffering in this life. We need to recognize that John is us. And when John is weeping, he's standing there weeping as we would be standing there weeping. As many times we often weep. We need to understand that God, when he sees us weeping, wants to put his arm around us and says, Stop weeping. weeping. You don't have to cry. I've got it in you. I'm going to accomplish it. Just like when Jesus appeared to the disciples. They came walking across the sea on the water, and they were scared to death. They were scared to finish. And Jesus said, fear not, it is I. No problem. God's plan has been written of all eternity. God is working out. Ephesians 1, 4 says this. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Before God created the world, he chose you be in him. He's worked that plan out so far. You've come to the place where you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You've experienced the power of conversion, the power of faith in Christ, the working of God. You've begun to see God working in your life. The things that didn't used to bother you, bother you now. You say, something's happened. God is working in my life. God is changing me from what I was to what he wants me to be. God is working his plan that we should be holy and blameless before him. Before God put the molecules together, before he put things together to create life, our loving Father was working, listen to me, he was working to wipe every tear from our eyes. There's no need to weep. Weeping has a place in the night. But when morning comes, God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. The Lamb has already, listen to me, won the victory. He is victor, conqueror. Before the other runners could even get their track shoes on, Jesus had already run the race. Across the tape, and he is the winner. The end is not in doubt at all. Listen to me, just because he hasn't broken the seals and opened the scroll doesn't mean that it might not happen. The plan is in place. Why is God delayed? Well, he has patience for all of us. There are some, even here today, that have not put their trust in Christ, and God is being patient with them. 
that they might come to the place where they might know and understand. Perhaps there are some that will be listening to this on the internet. You need to know that God is patient. He is delaying, not because he's unable to bring things to a close, not because he's not working in our world, but he wants to give you time to put your faith in Jesus Christ and be saved. He is looking for that in your life and ours. God is not slack concerning his promise. He is patient, not wanting any should to perish, but that all should come to repentance. Secondly, God's plan for victory is the opposite of worldly plans. We want a lion to come in and conquer and prove he's the king. The disciples, as they went to the garden, wanted to use two swords. We got two swords for him. He said, that's enough. More than enough. Only need one sword. So one year to cut somebody's ear off. He didn't say it this way. So I can heal it back on and tell you it's not going to happen by the sword. You can't bomb your way or fight your way or kill people with the sword and that's going to accomplish God's will. That's not how it works. It doesn't win that way. God didn't want a sword. He wanted a cross. Because without Jesus going to the cross, there could be no substitutionary atonement for our sins. After the Alamo, the Texicans wanted revenge. There's one guy that wanted revenge on Sinai. And they got Sinai and Zoo. They, they surprised us. They did an attack while they were having siesta. And they were a little drunk at the time. And they caused them to run. And they captured Santa Ana. They brought him back. They wanted to kill him. But Sam Houston didn't want revenge. Sam Houston wanted the nation. Republic of Texas. And so rather than kill Santa Ana, as the men wanted to do, he got him to sign the document that declared the liberty, the independence of Texas. And by having that document, he accomplished what he wanted to accomplish. You see, God has a greater purpose than revenge. God is not taking revenge on sin. He's saving the sinner. That's what God is doing. That's his work. God's way was for the lamb, not the lion, for the lamb, the lion as the lamb, to lay down his life for the sheep. This fulfilled the demand of justice. Romans 3.27 says, Enabling God to be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You see, God has to be just. Or he cannot be the judge. He has to punish sin. God can't say, well, don't worry about you killing that person. We'll forget about that. Not much of a person anyway. Don't forget about that lie you told. Don't worry about that. I mean, don't hurt, hurt ten people. It's okay. Don't forget about this terrible deed. You know, just don't worry about that. We'll ignore that. No, God can't do that. God has to punish sin. He has to be judged. But God also wants to be justified. He wants to declare people righteous rather than destroying them. For the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But when Jesus Christ came to this earth, he died and paid fully the penalty for sin. The wages of sin have been paid to Christ on the cross. Now God is able, because Christ has paid for the sin, He's able to turn around and say, I will justify you if you will have faith in Jesus Christ. If you'll put your trust in Christ, I'll pay for all of your sins. Jesus Christ's blood will be applied to you. Whenever I see you, I'll see Christ. And since I'm pleased with Christ, I'll be pleased with you. I will justify you because you've got faith in my son, Jesus Christ. That's God's way. And he did so for all the sheep from every tribe, language, people, and nations. Now the people of Israel didn't want that. They want everybody who was saved to become a proselyte to Judaism, a proselyte to be an Israelite. Even the apostles, you read the book of Acts, even the apostles were slow to understand this is how God's plan is going to save people. From tribes without them becoming Jews. Remember in Acts 10, it took the work of the Holy Spirit bringing the Spirit upon a bunch of Gentiles. Even, so frustrating. Peter didn't even get to the end of the message. 
for about a full day. People got saved. He didn't even get to the invitation. And these people started getting the Holy Spirit. And he recognized God has saved these Gentiles. And the Jews who were with him recognized God saved these Gentiles without them going through any of our rituals. And when they got back to Jerusalem, got called on the carpet, they heard what happened. They said, well, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance and faith. And they don't have to become Jews. You see, that's God's plan. God is working to save people. No matter where they are, no matter what culture he has put them in, no matter how he has brought them through in life, he's bringing them by faith and not by culture into salvation. God wants to save Jews and Palestinians. He wants to save Ukrainians and Russians. He wants to save the Ashnan and Tekvitet peoples. He wants to save the Basque and the Spaniards. All of these people, all of these tribes, all of these language groups that we're trying to reach around the world. He wants to do all of that with the power of the sacrifice of Christ without any of them having to change their culture or language. God is working to save people all around the world. Even at this moment, there are people who have wrapped up suddenly. There's not a time zone you can go to in the world where Jesus Christ is not worshipped and honored. God is working out his plan. He is accomplishing it all. Number three, God will have Christ are due all. All that we have. Worship is not just words alone. This is where I want to spend most of our time because this has application to us this week. He is worthy, verse 12 says, and verse 13 says, He is worthy of all power. He's worthy of all our power. They're saying, let the Lamb receive power. What are you talking about? Let him receive our power. How powerful are you? They say, well, I'm a little puny. Well, thank God that he gave you puny power. You could have had none. Whatever power you've got, it belongs to him. It comes from him. Whatever ability the Holy Spirit has given you, is to be used according to the will of God. He is worth it and more. <laughs> Secondly, he is worthy of all our wealth. The preacher, you're going to meddle. No. Listen, any money in our world that is not dedicated to the purposes God has planned for it is wasted. It's wasted. Now, God wants you to use some of that to feed your family. It's not wasted. God has other purposes for other money. But listen, all of our money needs to go where God wants it to go. Don't just say, well, I'm going to give God this 20. I'm going to give God this 10% of what I've got. Every bit of your money, you need to be saying, Lord, how do you want me to spend this money? Where do you want me to live? What kind of car do you want me to drive? Do you even want me to drive a car? Lord, is there something... Where do you want every bit of this? Lord, I've got some money. You've given me some money. What do you want done with this money? If we dedicate everything, he is worth all of our wealth. And he has a right to tell us, this is how you should use your money. Here's where it should be. He's worth, now this is not, he's worth all of our wisdom. So well, that's not much. You think the strength was puny. Way to get down to the wisdom. But God is, listen, God is not a dictator. God is a developer of people. God gives you wisdom and he gives you experience so you will gain more wisdom. All the experiences that God has given you, all the scripture you've read, all the psalms that you've memorized and thought about, God has been putting into you wisdom. All of that needs to be used for his glory and his Principle. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself are the principles we all have to work out in our lives and in the situations we encounter. That requires God's wisdom. That's why he gives, he gives us wisdom so we'll know how to take what we've learned and how to put it in the situations in life that we're facing at the moment. All of that belongs to God. He's worthy of all our might. You said, preacher, you just said that. No, talk about power. 
talked about might. Now, I don't know all the difference between the two, but I know they're two different words. What we've got to do is recognize that our strength comes from God. And what he gives us is to be used in his service. Whatever might we have, whatever along that line, use it for him. Verse number five, he's worthy of all honor. When we honor and respect, listen, recognize and respect that God is God. Most of the problems in our world, because people don't understand God, they think God is a servant rather than that God is God and the one who ought to be served. Steve Foster, Pastor Steve Foster from the Community Bible College of Baton Rouge wrote a short article that I read this week on Megan Rapinoe, the soccer star, who remarked after Achilles' tendon popped. Now listen to what she said. I'm not a religious person or anything, and if there was a God like this is proof that there isn't. What? You know what she's thinking? What most people think. God is a magic genie who's here to give me everything I want. No, that's not why God's here. God is God. And his purpose and his plan are far greater than your purpose and plans from your glory. God says, you're here to give me glory. You're here so I can pour into your life so you can use the things I've given you so that I might be glorified. Glorify thy name in all the earth we sing. What do we want to have happen? That God use me to glorify you. He is worthy of all the glory. God is not a magic genie. He is God. And we serve him. He is worthy of all our glory. The Bible says in him we live and move and have our being. It is impossible. Listen to me. It's impossible to overestimate what we owe to God or what he gives to us. Anything you're going to be thankful about this week? You know where you got it from? You got it from God. You got it from God. And then number seven. He is worth all of our praise. When we have funerals, people deliver the eulogy. Well, that's the word here. It's good words. Good words. It's a word for praise. We're going to say good words about the deceased. We're going to deliver a eulogy. I heard one this week. A man who contacted a preacher, his brother had died. He said, Preacher, this man was a criminal, his brother was a criminal. He said, Preacher, I, I'd really like you to preach my brother's funeral, and I'd like you somewhere in the funeral to say he was a saint. The preacher said, I don't believe I can do that. He said, I'll donate $10,000 to your church. He said, Well, I'll pray about it. I'll do the best I can. He preached the funeral, and he said, You know, the man here in the coffin, you know that he was a low down, dirty criminal. He lied and cheated every one of you. He was unfaithful to his wife. He was a criminal, but compared to his brother. <laughs> but you see how it goes. We should only have good words to say about God in heaven. Sometimes we complain about God. Remember we read through Job, and Job complained a lot. God he prayed to God, God, I don't understand what's going on. God, why are you doing this? All of these things. And in the end, God said, Job, of all you rascals standing around here complaining, Job is the only one that's honored me. He's prayed to me. He's wondered. He's prayed. He's defended himself. But he's honored me in all of that. We are to give God praise. We're to speak good words about the one seated on, on the throne and about the land. He is worthy to rule forever. And ever. And then finally, we see here at the end, after the four living creatures, if everybody's worship, the four living creatures say, Amen. And the 24 elders fall down and worship. Amen. It's a word for truth. It's not a word, okay, God, bring your will. I can stand. No, no, no. It's true. God, your will. Your scroll, your way, that's what I want. That's the only true way. I want your will. It is and should be so. Amen. Let it be so in my life and in our world. God, do your will. Glorify your name through all the earth. We want God to get all the glory. Here's 
what I suggest to you. If you want to order your life by truth, if you want to align yourself with God, put the amen in the center. That's where God is. God is the truth. Let God be the amen. And all around it, put all these things we just discussed, the power, the glory, the might, the wisdom, the wealth, everything around it. When you get everything around it aligned up with God, I suggest you do that this week. Every day this week, take one of these things. Start with power. God, I want to thank you for all the power you've given me. Get up Monday morning. Start praising God for the power. Think about the power you have. God, I want to thank you for the power that you've given me. And then dedicate it to God. God, I want to dedicate my power today. I want to use my power today to glorify you. Every day this week. How many days a week? Seven. How many of these principles? Seven. Seven. So we're going with that. Works out, doesn't it? Every day, there's one per day this week. Don't just take Thursday to eat turkey and praise God for dressing. Worship God every day this week. Take one of these and meditate. God, how do you want to use the power that you've given me today? And then be looking through the day. How can I use the power? You say, well, I don't have a lot of power. you got some power. How are you going to use that to praise God this week? How are you going to use the mic? And Lord willing, if I set it up right and you're getting the bulletin, you'll be getting an email every day of this week to remind you which one you're supposed to be doing that. So check your email this week. I'm sending an email this week. If it doesn't work, it's because I don't want to have to do technology real well. But if it does work, praise the Lord. Somebody's power is going to be used to do that. But take every day, look at your email and think about that one and say, God, I thank you for this. Lord, show me today. How I can use my will to honor you. How I can use my wisdom to honor you this day. This day, I'm going to focus on that one thing this day. Let's worship and live out the power of God.